I've worked with more and more photographers over the years, and a commonality between many of them is that they only have their photos in one place, which will inevitably lead to tragedy. If you've ever had the unfortunate experience of losing your data, you know how devastating it can be. And if you haven't, I promise you that it was gonna happen at some point. I'm a full-time landscape photographer who lives on the road, making content, and as someone whose livelihood is reliant on my photos and videos, data redundancy is extremely important to me. If you're someone whose photos only exist in one spot, or you've got a bunch of drives laying around, or you struggle with workflow management, then this video is gonna be for you. Today, I'm gonna to cover the best practices for managing your photography data, break down a simple and easy to understand workflow from the moment you capture an image to storing it safely, and my personal recommendation to make your life stress-free so you never have to worry about losing a photo again. To start off, let's talk about what you should be doing with your data management. Everyone watching this is gonna have a plethora of different situations, whether you're a hobbyist photographer, or you're a semi-pro wedding photographer, or you shoot full-time landscape photography. No matter your level of occupation, you should be following the 3 2, 1 rule. If you aren't familiar with this, it is a recommended guide for properly backing up any form of data, not just your photography. It essentially says that you should have three different copies of your data on two different media types, with one of those copies being off-site to the others. Hence, 3 2, 1. I realize not everyone watching this can accomplish this very easily depending on their situation or budget. However, if you can accomplish any part of this, it's always better than nothing at all. The best part about 321 is that it also goes a bit of an order of importance, with the most important being at least one redundant copy, then a second copy if possible, following by having one of those copies be on a different medium than the rest. Think spinning hard disk versus the cloud. Lastly, having that data stored somewhere else physically is technically the lowest of the priorities, but it should still be your goal eventually. And note that cloud storage as one of your backups accomplishes both a different type of medium and a different physical location. So now that you know what you should be doing with your data, how do we accomplish that easily and affordably? Before I can answer that question, we need to establish a consistent and organized workflow for your photography. Here's the thing about generalizing how you should handle your photos. Everyone has a different situation and they're gonna have different needs. For example, if you're a wedding photographer, shooting on dual slots for your redundancy during the wedding is far more important than someone like me, who for the most part wouldn't experience catastrophe if my sunset shoot got corrupted. Another example is you might be the type of person who organizes all of the photos by changing the file names on the folders, whereas I am not. Thus, everything I'm about to break down is my own personal workflow, but I'm gonna explain it in such a way that you should be able to adapt it to your own preferences. We're gonna start at the beginning. I was born in April, <laughs> I'm totally kidding. We're gonna start right as you take an image. I only use one memory card when shooting, but using two cards functions the same, so if that's something that works for you, do it. One very important thing for me is that I never erase a memory card until that data is on three other devices. SD cards are inexpensive nowadays and having extra is pretty affordable. This allows me to follow the 3 2, 1 rule even when I'm out in the field before I've gotten the chance to back everything up completely. Another good practice here is to not put all of your photos on a single SD card. This is extremely important when doing something like flying a drone. For example, if I get some amazing shots and I land the drone to switch out the battery, many times I'm also gonna switch out the SD card so if something happens to the drone while it's in the air, I at least walk away with some usable images rather than losing everything. After a shoot, I typically offload all of my images from that day to my Lightroom catalog. This is a perfect time to break down my catalog organization. Everyone's gonna have different setups for this. Many of you likely have all of your images on one catalog, but for me, that's impractical because I need to access a lot of my work on the road. Thus, I split my catalogs up. Regardless, this workflow is malleable and can work for anyone. My suggestion is to make a new catalog when you go on a photography trip or you have a client assignment or you're shooting a specific wedding. It doesn't necessarily have to be a new catalog every trip if you're traveling often to shoot like I am living on the road. Currently, I break up my catalogs into quarters throughout the year, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. While this sounds a bit complicated, it's really not once I show you how easy it is to integrate it into your current workflow. And most importantly, it allows you to follow best practices when it comes to data management. So let's say we go on a trip to, I don't know, Patagonia, which I will actually likely be in when this video comes out. So make sure to subscribe down below so you don't miss all the fun that Sophie and I get up to. So anyways, let's say I go out for a full shoot on Patagonia and I come back and I import my images into my new Patagonia catalog. That means that the images are now on my laptop and the SD cards. That's one level of redundancy. But I'm gonna take it a step further. And after every day, I copy all my new images to an external backup SSD. This SSD is not for long-term storage. It only is used for quick backups and to mirror my laptop. And I chose an SSD because a transfer that would take about an hour using spinning disk drives only takes about six minutes on an SSD. And after a long day of shooting, that's really crucial. 
Now my photos are backed up in three places. And while you should never consider housing images on an SD card, reliable backup, it is good enough until you get home. The last step is to make sure that once you're back from your trip, to back up your new catalog to your main backup system, which in my case is this new NAS unit that Ugreen sent me over, which I'm gonna be covering shortly, so keep watching. Splitting catalogs like this allows me to work and edit my photos from my laptop immediately without the need of an external drive or being at home. By splitting them up this way that I do, it makes it much more easier and more portable to back up throughout the year as well. Let's say Q1 is over and it's time to start working on Q2. I'll put the Q1 catalog on my external catalog SSD, confirm that it's backed up on my main backup solution, and then I delete it from my laptop, making space for Q2's images. Then at the end of the year, I create a catalog for that entire year let's just say 2023, and I import all of that year's catalogs into one. The beauty of this is that it will import all the previews, settings, and organization from each catalog, but it won't move the files in the file system so that your backups that you've been making throughout the year will still match. You just have to make sure you back up that new 2023 catalog as well. And if you're wondering why I don't just start the year with a catalog for that entire year, it's because I'd run out of space on my laptop early into the year. By breaking them down into quarters, it just personally allows me to keep my most recent and worked on photos at my fingertips. If you don't have as many photos or you don't need consistent access like I do, you could easily just make a yearly catalog at the start of the year. Or if you shoot way more photos than I do, you could break these catalogs up even more. This methodology is expandable no matter your use case. Now, if you're the type of person who has a single catalog for all of their photos and only edits photos from their home office, don't worry, this also works really easily for you. Instead of breaking your catalogs up or needing to worry about catalog portability like me, when you get back from your trip with that new catalog, just import it into whatever your main catalog that you use is and make sure to select copy new photos to a new location and import. This will import all the editing or organization that you might have done on your trip, plus it puts the photos into your main catalog folders. Regardless of how you choose to organize your catalogs, the most important question is how are you backing up your images so that you don't lose them in case of a tragedy? Many of you watching probably have a pile of external drives laying around that are completely disorganized and full of chaos. Or maybe you have all of your photos on a single drive, which is honestly terrifying. Stu, I am looking at you. <laughs> Stu was brave enough to share on our Discord that all of his photos were only in one place until he got a backup system, and I definitely lost sleep that night. That's where the Ugreen NASSYNC DXP4800 Plus comes in. NAS stands for Network Attached Storage. Now that doesn't tell the full story here, as these units typically also implement something called RAID redundancy, which stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. You can also find these types of units served in what's called a DAS, or Direct Attached Storage. But NAS arrays are much more preferred for a myriad of reasons that I'm going to highlight in this video. The most important operation a NAS device does is redundantly backup and manage your data so that you don't have to. This means that if one of the hard drives in the device fails, the data is safely stored on the other drives. Plus, we can set it to back up our data to the cloud for even more redundancy. More on that in a bit. Ugreen kindly sent me over this unit for me to use for this video. They did not pay me to make this video, but they did give me this unit to keep. I stipulated in our agreement that I can say whatever my experience was without review. These will be available for you to pre-order at a highly discounted rate, which you can find with the link down below the like button. The best part about their lineup is you can get a system that best suits your individual needs. For example, they have a two drive bay unit that's highly affordable and allows you to use RAID 1, meaning if you have two hard drives, one drive will mirror the other. This gives you data redundancy, but cuts your space in half. For my data needs, the NASSYNC DXP4800 Plus is a much better option as we'll be using RAID 5 with four different drives. If you want a breakdown of each RAID type on these NAS units, you can check out that on Ugreen's website. The beauty of RAID 5 is that you get the same redundancy as RAID 1 without the cost of as much data loss. RAID 5 essentially gives you all of the space minus one disk in the cluster. For example, if you had four 10 terabyte drives in RAID 5, you'd have 30 terabytes of usable storage, or if you had 10 10 terabyte drives, you'd have 90 terabytes of usable storage. Speaking of storage, another benefit of a RAID array like this is that it's expandable. This means that if you start off with smaller affordable drives for what you need now, later down the road, you can replace them with much larger drives as you grow into them. That's really all you need to know about RAID 5 because <laughs> explaining how it works is kind of like voodoo magic. Know that if any drive fails, the Ugreen NASSYNC is gonna alert you, and then all you're gonna do is you're gonna pull out that drive, replace it with the new drive, and let the unit rebuild the RAID array. Boom, your data is saved. I spent the past month trying out Ugreen's entry into the NAS market. The hardware is well-built and it has some features that the competition does not, all while being more affordable. Quickly comparing what Ugreen sent me to the Synology DS923+, Ugreen is as low as $420 with my link down below versus $600. 
It has a five core processor versus a two core processor. It has eight gigs of RAM versus four gigs. And most importantly, it comes with both a 2.5 and 10 gig ethernet port versus a single one gig ethernet port, which is gonna be very important for working on photo catalogs over the network that I'm gonna talk about soon. Plus it has more modern ports like a USB-C and it even has an SD card slot on the front of it for us photographers. Needless to say, the value for what you're getting is unmatched in the home NAS market. Something to note though, is that you can only access this unit over the network, not directly attached. So don't get confused by that USB-C port on the front. And while this isn't a review, I must include that the software is currently still lacking features because it's in beta testing, but over the past month that I've had it, three to four updates have continually added clarity, fixes, and features. Thus, I'd expect by the time these units go into production that the software will be fully featured and complete, but I do want to mention that because I always believe to evaluate a product for what it is, not for what it's promised to be. Something really cool that Ugreen is doing is that they have a beta testing program where they've sent a lot of these units to lottery chosen members, many of whom are knowledgeable about NAS and grade systems for the exchange of testing the software and units in a wide spectrum of scenarios before the units even hit Kickstarter. This is a great way to properly develop a new product trying to enter an established market. If you haven't connected the dots yet, a NAS like Ugreen's DXP4800 Plus is gonna make your data management life so much easier and less stressful. There's essentially two approaches you can take for how to use it either as an archive strictly for backup or to use as an active backup, meaning that you work using the files from your NAS. Before I put mine into storage, I used a Synology 5-bay NAS to backup and archive all of my photos. My workflow was essentially this. I would take a trip, make a new catalog for that trip like I laid it previously, return home, and immediately backup everything to the NAS. This acted only as an archive, and at the end of the year, I would make sure that all the files on the NAS matched any changes that I had made from the time when I originally backed up those files. You can do this easily with apps like ChronoSeq that will only copy new and updated files to the archive, which will keep everything in sync. Using this method accomplished our goal to have three copies of our data for redundancy. One set on my active drive I use for working on my photos and two copies on the NAS. Remember that it uses RAID 5, so one layer is a redundancy. But that doesn't cover the 321's requirement of having one offsite backup. And that's another amazing feature of having a NAS, which I'll remind you means network attached storage, meaning it's connected to the internet. The Synology NAS I used has the ability to sync to cloud services such as Google Drive, Backblaze, or it even has the ability to sync to a second NAS unit. That means that if you did wanna pay for cloud storage, you could set up a second NAS at grandma's house and sync to it. This is one of the greatest advantages of using a NAS over anything else. Not only does it allow you to offload all of your data tasks onto a separate unit, it also handles all the syncing over the cloud without you having to touch a thing. It also means that if for whatever reason you're away from home without a specific file or image, you can just log into your Google Drive and grab it. Currently, Ugreen's NAS Sync doesn't have the ability to back up to cloud services yet, but it can back up to other Ugreen units. I've also been told that the release version will have Cloud Sync and should be able to sync to popular services like Google Drive or Backblaze. By using a cloud service or second unit backup, we've accomplished that three, two, one rule. But what if you wanna use your NAS as your active drive while also providing the same data redundancy? Meaning that you store all of your photos on the NAS and you work from it instead of an external drive or locally on your computer. This is possible, but it comes with a few things to keep in mind. First, Lightroom catalogs cannot be used on network attached storage, meaning the actual catalog file that houses all of your edits must be located locally on the machine that you're working from. Remember, Lightroom doesn't contain the actual photos, it just points to the file locations of those photos and edits them non-destructively. Because of this though, even though the catalog file cannot be ran from the NAS, you can have the catalog point to all of the photos on the NAS. Just remember to back up your catalogs every once in a while, or you can get even more creative and house all your Lightroom catalogs on something like Dropbox or Google Drive. I'll link a guide from Lightroom Queen on this down below that you're gonna to wanna to check out. Doing this has multiple benefits. First, it means that your Lightroom catalog will have multiple versions stored in the cloud on Dropbox, meaning that if something ever happens or goes wrong, you can use Dropbox's version backup just to roll back to an older version. Secondly, this also means that if you like to edit from your desktop and then switch to your laptop to do some culling from the couch, you can just let Dropbox sync and voila, now you can. This even works in a pinch if you leave home and you have previews or smart previews integrated within your catalog, but you still need to get the full raw or TIFF file. Just find the image in your catalog, hop onto your cloud storage that your NAS syncs to and grab that full raw to edit and export no matter where you are on the road. One downside or warning that I'm gonna say for using your NAS as an active drive is that you're gonna be using those drives often, which is gonna add up activity hours quickly. Thus, you might wanna get hard drives that are made for more active users rather than long-term storage. There's an amazing data set about drive failures and reliability that Backblaze releases every year that I'm gonna link down below so you can check out and find the most reliable drives for you. One last feature I wanna mention about all of Ugreen's NAS units is that they allow you to install M.2 SSD cache drives into the unit. 
This basically means that if you decide to use your NAS actively, whatever catalog photos you're working on will get cached into the SSD drive, allowing you to access those files faster and spin up your disk less, meaning less wear and tear on your hard drives. That's a win-win. <sighs> okay, that was a lot to cover. No matter how you choose to use it, you absolutely should get a NAS unit to manage your backup and storage. You can find the right solution for your needs from Ugreen with my link down below and get up to 35% off with early bird pricing. The peace of mind and ease of use is unmatched and I genuinely cannot recommend it enough. And if you like this video, YouTube thinks you're going to like this video. So thanks for watching. There's got to be a rainbow out there somewhere. We just got to go find them. Later.